What's up Simonix, welcome back to a new vlog episode and this week we're going to focus on a very very important question. Yes, no, maybe. But is this actually a question or more like a hint? Over the last time I got a lot of comments on my videos that were using Cordova, that I should use Capacitor and I also reviewed a lot of the old comments on the video that I did on this topic. Today we will answer a lot of questions that you might have about Capacitor, about migrating to Cordova, about the future of Capacitor, so stay tuned for a lot of great content. If you're new to Ionic and start a new application and see this lock on the CLI, it's definitely recommended right now or as of now to use Capacitor in your applications. But what does this mean about Cordova? In general, uh, if you have an old application that is using a lot of Cordova plugins, there's not really the need to upgrade this to Capacitor. Of course, you can do it, you can migrate it, uh, we will talk about this in a second as well, but overall, it's not like you will get a lot of performance benefits from upgrading to Capacitor. Still, Capacitor of course comes with a lot of benefits that we will also talk about. It's not like you are updating your app from uh, AngularJS to Angular 9 it's not going to have this kind of impact on your application. Also, over the last time I got questions like, Apple is rejecting my uh, WebView apps or Apple is killing all hybrid applications and this is not related to Cordova or Capacitor at all and also not really related to Ionic. It is simply not true. They are not killing web apps or uh, applications that look like this. They are limiting applications to the new uh, WK WebView instead of the old deprecated UI WebView. But you can achieve this with both uh, latest version of Cordova and also the current version of Capacitor. Also, our application is not loaded from a server, it is completely bundled into the application. Even if you use something like AppFlow or uh, Code Push updates, the main uh, part of your application is still a native application and lives in this container. You're not serving something from a completely different URL, which would be uh, really insecure and doesn't surprise that Apple is rejecting this behavior. But with Ionic, with Capacitor and Cordova, none of this applies. So because Ionic is recommending Capacitor, they are completely betting on this topic. Does this mean Cordova is dead? I would say definitely not. If you take a look at the Cordova uh, project on GitHub, there are thousands of plugins, new Cordova plugins come up and it's not like Ionic is the only uh, framework or company that is using Cordova. You can also create a completely bare Cordova application. Uh, you can just wrap whatever web page you've created with Cordova inside the native application and I think other frameworks still enjoy this approach. So from what I know, I wouldn't say Cordova is dead. You can definitely still use it. Ionic is definitely supporting it still over the next years and therefore it's still a valid option. But let's move away from Cordova and focus on a bit more of Capacitor. Of course, the first natural question that comes up, if I've built my app with Cordova, can or how do I switch to Capacitor? Of course, this depends on the size of your application. For a small app, I'm pretty sure it will be like perhaps an hour. Because how Capacitor works is kinda easy uh, with setting up the native projects and you can still integrate all of your old Cordova plugins or use the core APIs of Capacitor. There is a migration guide inside the Capacitor documentation and that guide isn't actually too long. It's basically about replacing your config XML with basically doing the things that Cordova is doing automatically, manually inside your native application projects for iOS and Android. So how can I then use Cordova with Capacitor? Well, Capacitor's backwards compatibility for Cordova plugins is really great. To install it, you just install the npm package of the Cordova plugin and Capacitor handles the rest. Capacitor works with the native projects as like source assets that you also check into your uh, like Git repository. The project that you get, for example, for iOS is the main project and a pods project based on Cocoa Pods to install the additional libraries. For Android, this works kind of the same and you can find a whole great article on this topic by Max Lynch. I'll also link to it below the video if you're interested in all of the internals. Some of you jumped to the conclusion that if I can use Cordova plugins within Capacitor and Capacitor targets progressive web apps as well and Electron, that I can use Cordova plugins inside a progressive web app. 
That conclusion is apparently wrong. The Cordova plugins inside Capacitor still require a bit of the Cordova uh, environment in the application and within a native application Capacitor handles this and um, I don't know exactly what the magic of that environment looks like. I know they ported a bit of the code from Cordova into their project so it works but on the web which is a progressive web app there is no Cordova environment and so the Cordova plugins that you edit through Capacitor are not available on the web and you can't use them inside your progressive web. Another question, can I use every Cordova plugin with Capacitor? The answer to that question is no, but because you can use like 95% of the Cordova plugins on this way with Capacitor. It simply works. But I also got a comment that a lot of the specific elements of Cordova don't work with Capacitor. And that's especially the case if uh, the plugin requires some certain hooks to execute, uh, variables for the initialization, or any specific elements of the Cordova environment that are not available within Capacitor. There's a list, an actually very tiny list of plugins known not to work with Capacitor that you can check out on the Capacitor page. The other plugins that, for example, require a variable to be passed to the native project can be used as well because you're in full control of the native project. You once generate the iOS and Android project with Capacitor and afterwards Capacitor is not touching, regenerating or doing any kind of thing like Cordova is doing to your native project. That means you can still install the plugin and then just set the settings in the Android manifest or in the iOS plist to have these native variables available in these projects. And you don't need to rely on the Cordova tooling or the uh, config XML to inject these values into the native project. It's really easy in the native project itself. Which also brings us to the question, why do I actually check in my iOS and Android folder? I've never done this with Cordova. Yes, with Cordova, any of your colleagues could check out the project without the um, platforms folder and they would just add the platform based on the information in your package, JSON and config XML. These elements are not used with Capacitor anymore. So as I said, Capacitor only creates these native projects once and afterwards only syncs your web assets into the native project or updates the native project if you make any uh, changes to plugins. That means you can configure your native project, you can add files, images, whatever it might be to the native project, they are checked into source control and whoever checks out your project will also check out the native project and get all the custom settings that you made in that project. This is like the core philosophy of Capacitor to have really just a small tooling included because this is really problematic if the Xcode updates, if iOS or Android SDK updates and that's also the problem that a lot of you had with Cordova in the past when things suddenly stopped working. So with Capacitor there are no magical updates of your project, you just configure it, you can update it yourself if you want to and that's actually a lot easier. Another quick question that I saw, can I actually run my app on the device or do I have to run the Ionic build and npx sync all the time? Well, apparently there is a live reload command which looks like this and I use it all the time to actually have live reload available on my iOS device, on my Android device and on the browser because this will bring up a server with your local IP of your computer it will be uh, used as the URL for testing when you install the application. And that also means, uh, since it's basically the same IP, that I can deploy the application to all of my devices and all of them have live reload. It is amazing. Amazing, really nice. Are Capacitor apps more native than Cordova apps? I think this question is interesting, but maybe we should answer this uh, in another video because lately there was once again a conversation about how native Ionic applications are. In general, um, I've already said this, it depends on the point of view. From a point of a customer, they are completely native because they live on your phone, they are inside the app store, that's an application. From a technical point of view, you can discuss about hybrid and all these concepts, but in general, uh, Capacitor wraps your application in a web view and Cordova also wraps your application in a web view, which is not really a huge difference. Um, Capacitor might work a bit different, but let's talk about this. If you're interested in the conversation about hybrid versus native, uh, please let me know a comment and we will talk about this again. I'm not going to use Capacitor unless I can build from the command line. 
Well, this is a valid argument and I definitely see it, but you can actually do this. So since the capacitor philosophy, as I said, is to have really just a small a bundle of tools available. This is currently not included in the general tools. What you can do is you can definitely prepare your Android or iOS application with a sync and then you don't have to open Android Studio. You can simply navigate into the Android folder and use the Gradle scripts to create a bundle release, a bundle debug file, deploy to your device, anything like this, just using the native tooling of the specific application platform. Which means just use the best tools available for Android, which might be Gradle, or for iOS, which I think are kind of limited uh, with the Xcode command on the command line, but there's also Fastlane that you can use with actually both iOS and Android. So there are definitely options available to build your Capacitor application, Ionic application in general from the command line. Will Capacitor replace Cordova? I honestly have no answer to this because this is looking into the future. Um, a lot of applications right now are still powered by Cordova. They have uh, a lot of Cordova plugins. They're likely not migrating to anything else right now. So Cordova will definitely live like on for the next I don't know, five or 10 years. But I definitely think that if people are starting new applications, um, they will now use Capacitor. So if you would draw something, it will look like the apps started with Cordova will kind of decline while Capacitor goes up. And at some point there will just be a few Cordova applications and many more Capacitor apps, I guess. And finally, what's the roadmap for Capacitor for 2020? We just already saw the release of the 2.0 version, which came with additional support for the latest Swift and Xcode versions and iOS versions and also Android X was included. But of course the journey for Capacitor continues. And here's what I read between the lines and in the various articles that I actually went through before creating this video. The first thing that you will likely see very soon is an implementation of a native HTTP provider within Capacitor. This will help people to resolve their course issues because the origin of Capacitor applications is like Capacitor and they will run into a lot of troubles with JavaScript. This is currently in merge mode and I think it will be likely in one of the next releases. So a very cool thing if you encountered course issues in the past and couldn't resolve these on the server side. If you were hoping for some great desktop support, there's actually a little bummer uh, as far as I've seen. They're reducing the Electron support to beta once again because they want to focus for now on iOS, Android and progressive web app. I think it makes sense because these are the platforms that are most popular and once they're finished or feel confident about the state of these platforms, they will once again go back to uh, supporting Electron in a better way. I have no date about this. Perhaps if somebody of the Ionic team is watching, let us know. But what I read as well is that since Capacitor is now in 2.0, uh, a lot of people are now using Capacitor. They made it like the standard for new Ionic applications. They invest more resources in the development and maintenance of Capacitor, which means we will see things that we don't know of yet, perhaps more core APIs, uh, more community plugins, perhaps even supported by Ionic, anything like this. But it's always a good sign if the Ionic company is putting more resources in this topic. And one feature that I kind of was looking for and was like a future dream and mentioned in one of Mac's article was having a layer that makes it really easy within uh, JavaScript to access native uh, SDKs. This exists, for example, in native script where you can basically target every native uh, SDK uh, right in your application, uh, even if the SDK just came out a day ago. This is not something super easy. It comes with a lot of security concerns as well. Should your app really be allowed to automatically access all the native SDKs from JavaScript with this layer? It's kind of a complex topic, but I think this would be a cool addition to Capacitor as well. But as of now, it is already pretty easy to generate a new plugin. I've done this in the last video, which I actually couldn't remember when I just watched it. I, 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 but that's basically it. I hope this answered a lot of questions that you have about Capacitor. If you're starting a new application, I would definitely recommend to go with Capacitor. For all my future courses, products, uh, tutorials, whatever it might be, I will definitely use Capacitor since I can always fall back to the Cordova plugins in Capacitor. And otherwise, I think the tooling of Capacitor and the general philosophy make it 
uh, a lot better in terms of using it in one, two, three years. I think it will be a lot easier to update your capacitor applications in the future than it might be to still work with Cordova that was initially created over 10 years ago, I think, or something like this. And capacitors general core technology stack is just better in my eyes. Let me know your opinion about Capacitor, let me know if you got any other questions, I hope I was able to answer most of them. And of course, if you want to see Capacitor tutorials, make sure that you stay subscribed to the channel and hit the bell icon so you never miss out any new video. That's it for the week, I hope you will have a great week of using Capacitor, perhaps give it a try if you haven't used it, I'm sure you will enjoy it. If you got any questions, always feel free to ask and I will catch you next week. Stay safe and like always, happy coding. Simon.